back cast you have only speed, so quicker on the back cast. And then the forward cast is that screen door handle power snap. The angle matters. If you want to cast a short cast, take your thumb up to your forehead and finish the cast at your chin level. Forehead to chin. Forehead to chin. And the other big help would be if you put your hand under your elbow and take that elbow off on the back cast and put it back on on the forward cast. These are the little details that make false casting as beautiful to see and feel as you want it to be. As you lengthen line, you will have to add a little length to your stroke. You have to wait a little longer on the back cast for it to unroll. Use a little more force, a little more speed as that line lengthens. And you need to be able to cast perhaps 40 to 45 feet. So you must learn how to false cast. No matter how much explaining I do while I'm casting, it all moves too fast for you to do any analyzing. And so I have figured out that if we tilt it over to a horizontal plane and lay it out on the grass, you'll be able to see the parts of the cast. I've put two targets out 90 degrees off the rod tip, and they can be anything, a rock, a book, a jacket, whatever you like, just to give you a reference. This form represents the parts of the cast. First section would be the loading move, the second section the power snap, and the third section follow through in both directions. The heart of the cast is the power snap because that forms the loop and determines exactly where your line is going to unroll. And the power snap is all you need for very short casts, perhaps up to 35 or 40 feet. But when we have longer lines, and just power snap. Now that move is too short and sudden and we get tangles and a tailing loop is caused that way. So that power snap is not sufficient and as our line lengthens, we must include more in the stroke. And what we're going to include is a loading move, get everything started in the same direction, rod line, leader and fly, then power snap and then follow through. Follow through in this direction is loading move here in the back direction. Loading move, power snap, follow through. By the way, we call follow through backward drift. And you've never done it, so it's a new idea, but this is the way to find it. Load, snap, follow through. Load, snap, drift. Once you can see those parts and do it slowly, it will help your understanding. This is a tailing loop. Instead of an open-ended unrolling loop, the top level collapses and the loop closes, creating a tail. This is the way the knots that are formed in your leader that we blame on the wind come about. And the primary cause of a tailing loop is lack of a loading move. Let me show you. In a good cast, we begin with a loading move, getting rod, line, leader, and fly in motion before the power snap and follow through. On the tailing loop, we eliminate that loading move and just snap. And then we get something that could be as dreadful as that. And the line comes under the rod tip and catches and creates that nice knot. So remember, the first move is the important one. Move it before you snap it, and then the rest will be easy. Now there are other things we can see in this horizontal plane. And the first one of interest is the stroke length. How many inches does your hand have to travel to make a good cast? These targets are 90 degrees off the rod tip. And that is a 180 degree line and your best casts are made within those parameters. So if your stroke length is correct, the fly will go to the target. If your stroke length is too long, it will go behind the target. If it's too short, it will go ahead of the target. So it's very easy for you to figure that out. You just watch it in both directions and adjust your hand stroke accordingly. Now you can also see timing. Timing is a thing of feeling, but now you can see it. Just watch forward and backward cast. And as that line unrolls, 
and the leader starts to unroll, start the next stroke. Because the line has weight, and if you wait till everything unrolls, it will fall apart on you and you'll lose the nice feeling of casting. So watch it, then close your eyes and feel it. The third thing you can learn is line speed. The stroke is an acceleration to a stop. If you don't accelerate enough, you don't get the loop unrolling fully, and so you're in trouble. Or if you accelerate too hard, you get something like this. When it's perfect, the loop will unroll without falling dramatically, and you can tell by looking at it. The fourth thing you can learn is how much power to apply. Lots of people think that casting is all about power, and it's not, it's about speed. There are a lot of beginning casters who think this is a matter of strength, and they punch it, and punch it, and you get all kinds of ripples in your line. And so use less strength and more speed, and make it smooth, and enjoy it. Four things, stroke length, timing, line speed, and power. And then take this cast up to a vertical position, and try to incorporate that follow through backward, that drift move. After the back cast power snap, follow it up. You'll find it becomes rotary. Your elbow goes around in a little circle. And now look at that loop. See if it's going to your target. There is so much you can learn by casting in the horizontal plane on grass in slow motion. You can see stroke length, timing, line speed, and power, in addition to seeing each segment of the cast one after the other in slow motion. This is the best tool I can give you in terms of self-analysis so that you can figure out what makes a cast work. I hope you'll use it. In order to cope with all of the obstacles that Mother Nature throws at us in the form of wind or of trees in the wrong place, we have to be able to cast from horizontal on the right to nearly horizontal on the left. And it's really quite easy. It's just a rotation of the elbow. If it's a forehand side, then the elbow stays in close. When you get to horizontal, the palm will be up. If it's backhand, the elbow raises. As the rod angle gets lower, the elbow gets higher. But keep your hand above your eye level for perfect eye-hand target coordination. I'll demonstrate on these bushes. Imagine the clock face. And when I cast vertically, I'm at 12 o'clock. Now to go to 1 o'clock, angle the rod, elbow stays close. 2 o'clock, a little lower. And at 3, my palm is up, elbow close. On the backhand side from 12, the elbow lifts, 11, 10, 9. And the lower the angle, the more sure you want to put that hand just above your eye level. Knowing this, you'll be able to handle all kinds of conditions. This is an on-the-stream situation where overhanging branches and rock walls require a backhand low-angle cast. I want to talk to you about changing direction, and I'll do it first with the rod butt so I can do it slowly. When you put a fly on moving water, it doesn't stay there. It goes downstream or across the current. And now to present again, you must change direction, and the easiest way is to pick up the line and false cast your way back to that first position. But as we get better at casting, we don't want to waste all that time with a fly in the air, and so we use another technique to make it easier. We change position between the back cast and the forward cast. We end the stroke while the line unrolls. We reposition our hand and put it down again. So it's a rotation. The elbow goes out, the hand goes across, or back cast, the elbow comes in, and the hand goes across. We're doing this repositioning while the line is unrolling, and I call that drift time. And now with the rod. Drift is follow through backward. We end the stroke 
and reposition our hand during the time the line unrolls. Stroke, reposition, stroke. We can use that same time, that drift time, to reposition sideward for a change of direction. Stroke, reposition, stroke. Stroke, reposition, stroke. We can go from a high angle to a low one and put that line under an overhanging branch. The drift move is a smooth move. It's body and it's arm, and it gives a sense of completeness to the cast. We can drift sideward to change direction. We we'll move the hand sideward between strokes while that line is unrolling. So that drift move gives us the opportunity to do wonderful things and it feels just great. There is never a dull moment, there's never a dead moment in the cast when you use drift. It's wonderful. Hand tension is a major factor in whether or not we can make the hundreds of casts that are sometimes necessary in a long day's fishing. If you have a death clutch on that handle and never relax, you're going to end up with a very sore hand and sore arm muscles. We need to use that tension precisely and we need to rest on every single stroke and we rest while the line is unrolling. I think I can show it to you best with a sponge, dampened. The loading move would be a, an expanded sponge, and on the power snap, we contract it, and while the line is unrolling in the drift mood, it's expanded and we rest. On the forward cast, expanded. On the power snap, which is like the screen door handle, compressed and follow through. So it's loading move, snap, follow, load, snap, follow. So we only use tension on the power snap and the rest of the time we are not fighting it. I'll put it next to the rod, see if you can see that. A loading move, a power snap, follow through, load, power snap, follow through. Load, power snap, follow through, load, power snap, follow through. In this way, you'll be able to make those hundreds of casts in a day and enjoy every one of them. better fly fisherman if you can understand the design of your fly line. These are the basic designs. As you look at this page, you would attach your leader on the left side, and all of these lines are about 90 feet long. The first is a level line. It has a constant diameter throughout its entire length, and it does not lend itself well to delicate presentations. The double taper is the traditional trout fisherman's line. It begins with an eight to 10 foot tapered section, and then has a constant diameter belly, as we call it, for 70 feet, followed by a second taper. The next two designs are called weight forwards because all of the weight is concentrated at the front end of the line. The traditional weight forward line is 30 feet of weight it has a shorter taper than the double taper, six to eight feet, followed by a level belly. Then there's a back taper and shooting line, which is finer diametered. The triangle taper was designed by my late husband, Lee Wolf. This doesn't have a belly. It's a single continuous taper for the length of its weighted section, starting with a small diameter and getting larger and larger and larger. It too has a back taper and a fine diameter shooting line. These two weight forward lines will enable you to reach your longest distances with a minimum number of false casts. Marking your lines is the way to make the best use of those weight forward designs. This is a triangle taper, and I'll just strip out the weight forward section of it and show you what I'm talking about. Here it's easy to see where the weighted section ends. It's very thick and the shooting line is much thinner. The diameters are dramatically different. And so you put a mark at the beginning of that shooting line with a waterproof marker. And then when you're making long casts one after the other, you need only retrieve that shooting line until that mark is at your rod tip. You pick that weighted section off the water 
and make a forward cast and shoot the rest. It's magic. Another marking you might want to make is for weight at the front end of the line next to the leader connection. If it's a five weight line, put five dots on it. A six weight line, six dots. Whatever system you'd like, and then you'll always know what line weight you have, especially when that little label the manufacturer includes falls off your reel. I hope these little tips will be helpful to you. Shooting line is somewhat magical. It enables you to carry X number of feet of line in the air, but make a presentation that's a lot farther. And when you can shoot line, you can begin your fishing with the fly in your hand, start to false cast, and on every back cast, pull line off the reel. Then you release it on the forward cast, extending its length. As you get more line out, your stroke lengthens, your pull lengthens, your timing slows down until you have reached that fishable area. Now this brings up the subject of the line hand. It has duties. It has certain things it has to do. It has to service the rod hand. When your line is out, this line hand should put line under the middle finger of the rod and retrieve from behind that finger. When it has retrieved all you want, it reaches up, takes line from the finger and separates the two so that you are not going to get this line wrapped around that rod. Both hands have to move together in unison, parallel. The line hand can be a little lower than the rod hand, but it needs to move so that the rod is not sliding up and down on the line as it would if you kept it still. You want that feeling of complete weight, know exactly what you're casting. You also have to keep that line away from the rod or away from your vest, and so you need to be able to have a space as if you could put your head through it. That's a, a good, safe space. And so now when we're going to shoot line, we shoot after the forward power snap. There's the power snap. Power snap. And you can see this easily by looking up in the air, and after the power snap, you'll see line ahead of the rod tip. Snap. Snap, see the line. There it is. Let me show you on the water. Remember that you're going to look for the line ahead of the rod, which happens after the power snap. The stroke is finished, and then you release. It's very likely that you won't do this perfectly the first few times, and what you will do is release the line at the same time you snap, and then you get this sort of thing where it doesn't go anywhere, it wraps around the rod, and the line doesn't project. So after you do that a few times, then just hold on to that line a little longer until you see that ahead and then release it and it will work. Another way to practice shooting line is just by false casting and using your line hand as a control. On every back cast you pinch the line, on every forward cast you release it. Pinch, release, pinch, release. And this is also a way you can control your accuracy. If you're going to shoot line and you see you want to stop it, you can also pinch it off with that line hand. Timing changes when we shoot line. If we are not shooting line, the timing is very even. But when we're going to shoot line, we need to energize that rod for the extra line that's going to be shot. And so we go extra hard back, wait a second, and then a little extra energy forward. Bringing it back with more force on the back cast does not mean bringing it back farther. It just means coming up almost against the wall, extra hard. And then that line will unroll completely and pull back on the rod tip. And that's sort of a pre-loading. It has your rod already bending so that when you come forward, you get a lot more energy out of the rod. One more time on the timing. Even, even, harder, wait longer, drive it. I think you can see now why I said that shooting line is a magical technique.
A dry fly fisherman has to be aware of what we call drag. Drag is the motion that makes that fly look as if it's a water skier instead of a free floating insect. And it's caused by the currents that work on the line and leader. And so we need to affect that by doing what we call a reach cast which will put the rod and the upper part of the line upstream of the fly so that the fly drifts down first and gives you a longer float before any drag can affect it. The way we do it is to make our power snap where we want this to go for accuracy and then during follow through time, we're going to change our position. So you need to find out where follow through time is. Power snap, follow through. Now I'm going to go power snap. During follow through, I move the rod upstream with the line. There's one other factor. If I just cast and don't shoot any line or slip any line, I will shorten my cast. So after I do the power snap, I release the line hand and the fly will go where I want it and be accurate. Now, I, because the river is running from my left to my right, I reach upstream across my body. If the river were running in the other direction, then I would reach out like that. Once you have practiced this and understand it and just know you can do it, you're going to have longer drag-free floats in all of your dry fly fishing. This is an oval cast technique. I learned it from Lee Wolf, who developed it for using short six-foot rods. But with long rods, we can take advantage of it. If you have a heavy air-resistant bug, or if you're in deep water with a rocky shore behind you, where you might hit your fly on it, it's a really good technique because the line goes under the rod tip. And as the line and leader unroll, they're riding up. In our traditional cast, the line and leader unroll downward. And so when you need it, when you need that line and leader to go in a different direction, the oval really helps. Now the way we do it is to adjust the power snap. On the standard power snap, we make a straight one, directly straight, but on the oval, we're going to curve it. My hand is going to move in a shallow curve from one point to another like this. And that makes the line come in under the rod tip. Then it rides up, we drift up, and the forward cast is just a standard, traditional forward cast, straight line cast. So a curving power snap on the back cast and straight power snap on the forward cast. It's easy to learn because it's circular. A circle is an easy path to follow. Spend a little time with this, and you'll find it will solve problems that standard casting doesn't solve. Wind can do crazy things to your fly line and be very scary. I can remember when I was very much afraid of it, but over the years I've learned that there are ways you can counteract it. I'd like to just pass by you winds from the four quarters, in front of you, to the side, behind you, and to the other side, and suggest ways of dealing with that. Headwinds are going to disturb the water surface, so you don't need to present delicately, you just need to drive it down to get that fly on the water. And so crouching and getting low is very helpful. And over your head is fine because you are strongest in that forward chopping position. Don't take that rod back any farther than vertical so that you don't have to fight the wind on your forward cast. There's a cushion of air under a headwind, and so you can also use a horizontal cast to get under it, some angle lower than vertical. 
So you have a few options there. Now, the wind is coming this way, but now I'm going to turn and let you see the effect it will have on me on my casting side.